Bawa Mukhayadin. Muhammad Rahim Bawa Mukhayadin died December 8, 1986, also known as Bawa, was a Tamil-speaking teacher and Sufi mystique from Sri Lanka who came to the United States in 1971, established a following, and founded the Bawa Mukhayadin Fellowship in Philadelphia. He developed branches in the United States, Canada, Australia, and the UK, adding to existing groups in Jaffna and Colombo, Sri Lanka. He is known for his teachings, discourses, songs, and artwork. Though little is known of his early personal life, Bawa Mukhayadin's public career began in Sri Lanka in the early 1940s, when he emerged from the jungles of northern Sri Lanka. Bawa met pilgrims who were visiting shrines in the north, and gradually became more widely known. There were reports of dream or mystical meetings with Bawa that preceded physical contact. According to an account from the 1940s, Bawa had spent time in Kadaragama, a jungle shrine in the south of the island, and in Jailani, a cliff shrine dedicated to Abad al-Qadir al-Jailani of Baghdad, an association that links him to the Qadari order of Sufism. Many of his followers who lived around the northern town of Jaffna were Hindus and addressed him as Swami or Guru, for he was a medical and spiritual faith healer and cured demonic possession. Subsequently, his followers formed an ashram in Jaffna and a farm south of the city. After meeting business travelers from the south, he was invited to visit Colombo, the capital of Sri Lanka, at the time, Ceylon. By 1967, the Serendib Sufi Study Circle was formed by these Colombo, predominantly Muslim students. Earlier, in 1955, Bawa had set the foundations for a God's House, or Mosque, in the town of Mankuban, on the northern coast. This was the result of a spiritual experience with Mary, Jesus' mother. After two decades, the building was finished by students from the United States who were visiting the Jaffna Ashram. It officially opened and was dedicated in 1975. In 1971, Bawa was invited to come to the United States and subsequently moved to Philadelphia, establishing a following and formed the Bawa Mukhayadin Fellowship in 1973. The Fellowship Meeting House offered weekly public gatherings. As in Sri Lanka, Bawa developed a following among people of diverse religious, social, and ethnic backgrounds who came to Philadelphia to listen to him speak. In the United States, Canada, and England, he was recognized by religious scholars, journalists, educators, and leaders. He continued teaching until his death on December 8, 1986. Bawa taught using stories and fables, reflecting the background of the student or listener, and included Hindu, Buddhist, Jewish, Christian, Muslim religious traditions and welcomed persons from all traditions and backgrounds. The words of Muhammad Rahim Bawa Muhayyadin reveal the Sufi path of esoteric Islam, that the human being is uniquely created with the faculty of wisdom, enabling him to trace himself back to his origin, Allah the creator and cherisher of all the universes who exists in oneness with all lives, and to surrender to that source, leaving the one God, the truth, as the only reality in his life. This is the original intention of the purity that is Islam. Bawa Mukhayadin spoke endlessly of this truth through parables, discourses, songs, and stories, all pointing the way to return to God. Over 15,000 hours of this ocean of knowledge were recorded.
People of all ages, religions, classes, backgrounds, and races flocked to hear and be near him. He interacted compassionately and lovingly with all of them, opening his heart to them equally, regardless of who they were. Presidents of countries and fakirs from the streets, the proud and the humble, the high-ranking and the low-ranking, the ordinary and the extraordinary, the extremely poor and the extremely rich, all sat side by side in his presence. An extraordinary being, Bawa Mukhayadin taught from experience, having traversed the path and returned, divinely aware, sent back to exhort all who yearn for the experience of God to discover the inner wisdom that is the path of surrender to that one. Once, when asked by disciples to write an autobiography for an upcoming book, Bawa Mukhayadin responded by saying that he would have to abandon his physical form in order to do so. Those disciples became extremely upset and told him that his physical presence was indispensable to them and that they could not live in the world without it. In that book, he said, all praise belongs entirely to the one who is Allah. His story is the totality of all there is. That is the great story. That story itself is truth. That truth itself is indestructible. That indestructibility itself has been made to exist eternally as a natural state. That eternity itself has no flaw. That flawlessness itself is complete. That completion itself is the one supreme being who is omnipresent everywhere. Now and for all time, the omnipresence that exists everywhere has been commingled with everything everywhere. Complete, dwelling within everything, it consists of resplendent light. The resplendent light itself exists without beginning or end, without equal. It has neither birth nor death dissolution nor boundary, start nor finish. It consists of purity. It has neither caste nor religion, existing beyond what is beyond scripture and doctrine. Made clearly evident through the state of compassionate love, it belongs equally to everyone. Children, our story consists of investigating and studying the story of that being. There is no story other than that for you or for me. This is indeed the natural reality. We are the artificial things. The natural does not perish. The artificial will be destroyed. Are you asking me for the story of that which is eternally indestructible? Or the story of that which will perish? Which story are you requesting? A mystical being in a mystical land, he was first sighted by spiritual seekers at the edge of the jungle near the pilgrimage town of Kadaragama, in what was then known as the island country of Ceylon. A man we know only as Periari Tambu, a humble man who sold cigars at temple festivals, and a few others from the town of Kokuville caught brief, unforgettable glimpses of him there. The tiny island that is shaped like a teardrop falling from the tip of southern India is a place known for its legendary as well as its sacred geography. Adam's Peak in the center of the island is said to have retained the imprint created by the impact of the foot of Adam from when he first touched the earth after being cast out of the Garden of Eden.
referred to in the ancient text of the Ramayana as Lanka. It is the site of Princess Sita's captivity by her abductor, Ravana, the evil demon king of Lanka. The Ramayana contains details of the battlefield where the armies of her husband, Prince Rama, fought the armies of the demon king, and describes the groves of exotic herbs dropped by Hanuman, the monkey king, who helped Prince Rama rescue his wife. When the island was called the Isle of Serendib, the voyage of Sinbad was described in the Thousand and One Nights. Medieval Arabs and Persians made regular pilgrimages to Adam's Peak. Ibn Battuta, a 14th century Arab traveler and scholar, made that pilgrimage. Legends record the visit of the Kutub, who, after visiting Adam's Peak, meditated for 12 years in what came to be known as the Hermitage Shrine of Daftar Jailani that lies at the edge of a precipitous granite cliff in the south-central portion of the island, a site that has become a place of saintly visitation and mystical meditation. How, uh, tell us something about uh, Bawa Muhyiddin, your memories. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Well, for me, he was an ancient man. He'd been around a long time. And so I, I stayed with him. And then uh, he married me to a girl in this fellowship in 1974. And um, in 1985, I had a dream about going to Mecca. Uh, he said, oh yes, you should go to Mecca. So uh, when I went to Mecca with, uh, with my wife, who was my wife then, and um, the Imam, and his name was Muhammad Rizak. His name was Muhammad Rizak. So Bawa gave me the name also, uh, Muhammad Rizak. He said, your name is Muhammad Rizak, because you needed a Arabic name to get into okay. uh, uh, to Mecca. So I went there and he said to, it was only four of us went. Myself, the Imam Dick Miller, who was, he was very tall, maybe 6'8 at the time. So he was very imposing. And so, uh, and Bawa said, you go as my representatives. He said, you two go as my, tell the, give my, Bawa said to us, <laughs> I can't believe it. Bawa said to us, you give my salams to the Prophet. So we went, gave our salams to the Prophet, did, uh, you know, did the Umrah, we did Umrah, but uh, he said, any one of my children who go for Umrah, it's the same as Hajj. So that's good, because there's a lot of people there. So anyway, then I went there and, uh, I don't know what to say. It's like a miracle. Uh, Bawa is like a mystical, mystical man. Really. It takes you through a lot of experiences. Once you connect with him on the heart level, he takes you all around. You have to expect anything. But you have to have faith, determination, and certitude. That was the first teaching, was faith, determination, certitude. Then he said, we need to have Sabur, Shukur, Tawakalala, and Alhamdulillah, uh, those four. So that was, he said, that was like the curriculum, you know. <laughs> oh, we had to learn that stuff. And uh, so I started doing the prayers. I went to Mecca and started doing the prayers. And um, then at some point, <laughs> I had some kind of vision or dream where uh, we were all sitting around Bao after he had, after he had passed, we all, I had a vision or dream, this 1986, about um, that, I, uh, that uh, Bawa, and see, Bawa could, would sing. All of a sudden, he'd start singing, and this unbelievable song would come, maybe for an hour, which is come through. So, 
in the vision, uh, we were sitting around, about a group of us were sitting around Bawa, and we were doing uh, some kind of zikr, you know, just singing zikr, la, la, la. And then I opened my eyes, and it was just me and Bawa were singing. And he told me, he was all dressed in like a freaky suit. He had a little beard like this one. <laughs> He was all dressed, looked really good. He said, so I thought, wow, this is, and he said, you can be successful. In other words, it was me and him singing at the end. And then the next day, I went to the fellowship where our group is at, and um, the Muazin, the main Muazin, gives the call to prayer. He asked me if I would do the call to prayer sometimes. I have no training, I can't hardly sing at all. And it's a miracle. So that's what I do now. I give the call to prayer sometimes, but not all the time, but sometimes, most of the time. And um, it's a blessing. Uh, how did you get in, uh, in, uh, met Baba? You mentioned about, uh, you saw, uh, you asked about the, uh, the how question did about I meet the him? Jesus uh, to Baba. What? You, uh, you asked a question about the Jesus uh, to Baba. Can first, you... first thing I asked him was tell me about Jesus and um, tell us about Jesus. and. Uh, The way he answered, I knew that he knew Jesus and he probably was there with Jesus. And so that was an experience I was having with him. Um, and, and then in 1974, and I'm jumping around here. 1974, I got married to one of our daughters. And, and we went to Ceylon. Kabbalah was in Ceylon, in Sri Lanka. <laughs> For two months we went to Ceylon and stayed with him, in, mostly in Jaffa. And we helped him to build a, a, mazar, a mosque out there. We, yeah, with, uh, what he called God's house, out on a little peninsula. And uh, that was a real experience, being with Paula in Ceylon. Pretty, pretty good. The whole thing is mystical and um, I would suggest uh, you know, a lot of all everything he said is on tape, pretty much. He had taped everything he said, and he said a lot of stuff. And so, if you want to learn about this, you just go to the fellowship uh, uh, the computer there, dot com, bmf, fellowship dot com, and you'll see a whole lot of books and schedules, and you can listen to uh, old Bauer discourses. It's pretty amazing. To hear words from Bauer, who, as far as I mean, I don't know anything about anything hardly, and but I, I mean, I, as far as I know, he's manifest, he manifested as the Kutub uh, of the of the universe. He's right there, right there. So um, I would highly suggest that people <laughs> look into their hearts. If, if you're connected to Bauer, you'll know like that. And um, God bless you, and we're all, we're all just brothers on this, brothers and sisters on this journey. It's a short journey. Um, we have to stay connected to God mainly. Everything else, pretty much, gang, everything else is a distraction. Family, job, money, country, religion, religion, ah, religion. <laughs> Be careful of religion and go directly to Allah. That's all I have, folks. No? Ah. <laughs> so, uh, so uh, what is your name, sir? Muhammad Abdullah. Uh, can you tell us something about uh, how you met Baba Muhyiddin? Uh, yes, I can, I can tell you I met. Uh, when when Baba came to America first in uh, October 1971, One of the people that met him, I uh, picked up as a hitchhiker up in Maine in the summer of 1972. And they told me about the shake. So I decided to uh, meet him when he came back uh, in America in uh, the spring of 1973. So I didn't have a car, so I was living up in Maine, which is the northernmost state on the East Coast, and I hitchhiked down, uh, 
spent a night in Boston, outside of Boston, and then hitchhiked the rest of the way down to, uh, to meet him. And I stayed four or five days and decided that's what I needed to do. So I asked his permission to go up and settle my affairs in Maine. So I hitchhiked back up. He gave me permission. I hitchhiked back up to Maine, settled my affairs, hitchhiked back down. Uh, and that, that's the end of the story. And I've been here ever since. Uh, tell us something about Bob Muldeen, uh, how, how, uh, how his personality and uh, 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 what are things basically uh, which younger generation can learn about, from him. Of course, well, uh, there are so many things, but uh, his whole life, his whole life was was service. He, you know, everything he did was. Uh, you could find in the Holy Quran and in the Sunnah of the Prophet All he did was service. The only time he was alone without any people around him was when he had to use the bathroom. That's the only time. All the, all the rest of the time when he was in America, he was surrounded by uh, people. He called us his children. He didn't call us his Murrays or his disciples. He called us his children because he was a fakir. He had no, he had no family. No wife, no children. So we were his children. And he he brought us up. You know, he brought us up, and his intention was to bring us up to the point where, when he left his body, he could turn us over to Allah. So that's that was his intention, and we're trying we're trying to fulfill his intention. We're trying to become Muslims because the only Muslim I've ever met in my life was the Sheikh because what is what is a Muslim to be in a state of Islam or what is the state of Islam to be in a state of total surrender to the will of Allah and we we have our we have our nafs we have our mind and desires and uh, we have to battle so that's what we're trying to do we're, tr we're, we're trying to get to the state that he that he was is in state of total surrender to the, to the will of Allah. So. Any spiritual, uh, there, there are so many spiritual experiences you, you witnessed. There are so many spiritual experiences you witnessed where while yeah. you were with Baba. Means, right. uh, the Baba used to uh, speak only Tamil language. Tell us something about the spiritual experience. Any, any you can emphasize, there are so many experiences, of course. Uh, well, we've all we've all had, you know, every everybody has had spiritual experiences, but whether or not they're aware of them or not, that some people are, some people aren't. But Bawa, you know, Bawa didn't make a big thing out of uh, those kinds of experiences. They're just just part of, you know, what happens uh, as you as you try to turn yourself over more and more to to the will of Allah and not let your mind take you this way and that way and so on and so forth so because there's not much you know there's very little really known about the sheikh because the sheikh said he didn't come he's he wasn't interested in history he said i'm not history he said i i've come here and he played on the word history and he said i'm here to say to tell his allah's his story that's what that's my only purpose here. So he was, he was like, he was like a conduit. So when he spoke, he wasn't him speaking. He was speaking the words that were revealed to him uh, from Allah. So thank you so much. Ah, welcome. Thank you for that.
Living in that land of legends, those seekers from Kokuville recognized Bawa Mukhayadin as a uniquely mystical being when they began to interact with him, begging him to teach them. He had lived peacefully alone in the jungle for so long that he had almost forgotten human speech. In The Tree That Fell to the West, Bawa Mukhayadin tells us, If it were not for the few who are seeking the truth, I would go back to the jungle to live. It is far superior to live in the jungle. There, lions, tigers, and bears surround me at night to protect me and do service to me. In the daytime, when I sing or meditate, snakes, peacocks, birds, and other beings surround me. It is a happy life in the jungle. Even though the animals cannot speak, they bow their heads down and listen attentively. Elephants are thoughtful. They look at the ground, and except for a slight swaying movement, they stand still, listening carefully. Then, when I finally open my eyes and see them, it is such a wonderful sight. There is always something new and wise to be learned from the animals. Some snakes listen with their hoods open, some with their hoods closed and heads bent low, as if they were bowing. There is so much truth to be learned from sights like these. You can see the power of God within them. See how it penetrates their lives. I can look into their hearts and realize the wonder of God's power within them. How great is the power of God? There is so much to learn there. So much to learn about the power of God by looking at each and every one of the animals. Although they are unable to speak, and people consider them to be unintelligent. I have not seen God's power reflected in human beings, as I saw it in all the animals when I was in the jungle, there where the power of God is so evident. When I look into the hearts of these animals, I see life resonating. I see it pulsing in them. I do not see the material world in their hearts, just the power of God. Gradually, he began to speak with those seekers, telling them that God was the only teacher. He consented only to study side by side with them, speaking and singing to them of his experiences of God in the evenings. The language in which he spoke to them was so rich and startling, containing a spectrum of Tamil words ranging from the most colloquial Tamil spoken in their villages and streets to the most elegant and correct Madurai Tamil, to the scholarly, classical Tamil from the Sangham period, including Arabic suwar from the Quran, and intricate details from the Ahadith, enlivened with Pali, Urdu, Persian, and English words, that they could only attribute their source to the divine. Eventually, he and that small group of seekers from Kokuville built an ashram in Jaffna, a town in the northern tip of the country. There, his mission was with the poor. I take care of four to five hundred sick people in Ceylon, a poor country. Many poor people come to me from a long distance away. I treat their illnesses, cure their minds, drive away their demons, feed and clothe them. I even give them the ticket money to come see me. This is the reason I have a farm, to help the poor and make enough for its upkeep. I used to get up every morning at four o'clock to go to the farm, although sometimes I would stay there as long as 40 or 50 days. Usually I would come back to the ashram at night and I would have no rest. There would be crowds of people to attend to. I farmed to earn the money to feed these people. I could have told fortunes and made quantities of money. I could have told them what was in their heart, their mind, or their body, but I would not do that. 
I labored using my body instead. Travel was difficult in that small country, yet the refuge of his presence was irresistible. As more and more people came to know about him and to hear him sing and speak of God, many of them began to invite him to stay in their homes. Among those people was Dr. Ajwad Makanmarker and his wife Amin Makanmarker, who lived in the city of Colombo. Bawa Mukhayadin told them that it would not be easy that he was like a tree upon which many birds needed to take shelter. If he was to agree to stay at their home, they would also have to accommodate these birds. He warned them that there could be many at times. Dr. Ajwad and his wife did not hesitate to agree to open their home to all who wished to accompany him. After that, Bawa Mukhayadin always stayed at their home when he was in Colombo. For 40 years, Bawa Mukhayadin spent his time with those seekers until he came to Philadelphia in 1971. Here, he told us, Before I arrived at 46th Street in Philadelphia for my first visit, Bob Demby, Carolyn's secretary, Zahora Simmons and some others sitting here arranged for me to come. They formed a society for that purpose, to invite me here. I did not come to Philadelphia with the idea of establishing a fellowship. There is only one fellowship, and that is Allah's. There is only one family and one fellowship. We are the children of Adam, and Allah is in charge of that fellowship. After that first visit, Bawa Mukhayadin went back and forth between Philadelphia and what by then had been renamed Sri Lanka until 1982, when he stayed in the United States until December 1986. In these distressing times, his words are increasingly recognized as representing the original intention of Islam, which is the purity of the relationship between man and God, as explained by all the prophets of God, from Adam, Noah, Abraham, Ishmael, Moses, David, Jesus, and Muhammad, may the peace of God be upon them, who were all sent to tell and retell mankind that there is one and only one God, and that this one is their source, attainable and awaiting the return of each individual soul.